Palestine Israeli troops committed four massacres in Gaza, killing at least 40 people in the last 24 hours. In Lebanon, Israeli occupation forces increased their attacks on the nation's southern border, hitting several targets. And in Argentina, authorities continue fighting several forest fires ravaging through the province of Córdoba. Hello, welcome from the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Deleuze Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Palestine Israeli troops committed four massacres against families in the Gaza Strip during the last 24 hours. Health authorities reported at least 40 people killed and 58 injured during the attack on residential areas. Emergency services continue searching for bodies trapped under the rubble or scattered on the roads. The Israeli regime has killed over 41,431 Palestinians in Gaza and wounded 95,880 others since the onset of its genocide war last October. In this context, the Palestinian government condemned the killing of at least five health workers as a result of Israeli attacks in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Health Ministry condemned the constant violations by the Tel Aviv regime of international and humanitarian laws, which prohibit the targeting of health workers. Over the past 11 months, Israeli troops have killed more than 990 health workers in Gaza, including doctors, specialists, nurses, and paramedics. Occupation forces have also arrested more than 300 others and destroyed numerous hospitals and more than 100 ambulances. An Israeli forces raided Al Jazeera's office in Ramallah on Saudi arbitrarily closing the media outlet for 45 days. According to local media, Saudi troops violently stormed the office with rifles in hand and masks, presenting a military order signed by Israel to close Al Jazeera without giving an explanation. The Tel Aviv regime soldiers on site handed the document to the head of the agency, Walid al Omari, and then told the staff to evacuate within 10 minutes and to leave all the equipment behind. This event follows the recent attack carried out by the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah with a barrage of missiles against the Ramat David Israeli air defense bodies. <laughs> This is a cowardly attack on the Arab and Palestinian press and freedom of expression and an attack on the Al Jazeera network in the first place. The occupation forces arrived here and stormed this office at around 3 in the morning. Large forces stormed the city of Ramallah, the Manara area and the surrounding streets, closed the streets and prevented anyone from approaching. Large forces stormed the office here and then handed us an order to close it for 45 days on the pretext that it supports terrorism and works on incitement and that they will confiscate all the content inside. And on Saturday, thousands of Israeli citizens gathered again in the streets of Tel Aviv to pressure the government for a truce agreement to free the hostages in Gaza. Protests in the Israeli capital have become more critical towards the government of Benjamin Netanyahu since the army announced the recovery of six Israeli soldiers killed in the southern Palestinian enclave. Since October 7, 2023, nearly 250 hostages have been under Hamas custody, while the Netanyahu cabinet has prioritized its political interests over the lives of prisoners. We are very uh, frustrated about this uh, situation because we are want to be democratic and uh, we believe in people and in good relationship with the Arabic in the area. We don't want to be influenced from this government who just want to part to, to make war. And uh, we want to live uh, the best uh, quality life for everyone in the Middle East and we want a democratic and a modern, developed, uh, place to live in the Middle East, all of us together. Meanwhile, in Germany, thousands of citizens demonstrated in Bremen city in support of the Palestinian cause while condemning the aggressions carried out by the Zionist regime in the Gaza Strip. Demonstrators marched through the streets of the city carrying Palestinian and Lebanese flags and raising slogans to demand that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu be held accountable for the crimes perpetrated against the Palestinian and Lebanese people. 
It also demanded an end to the genocidal war that the Israeli regime has been waging in Gaza for the past 11 months. Also in Sweden, thousands of people participated in demonstrations organized in Uppsala and Stockholm in support of the Palestinian people and demanding a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Demonstrators took the streets of these Swedish cities to denounce the constant aggressions perpetrated by the Israeli occupation against the enclave. During the demonstrations, the participants raised Palestinian flags in rejection of the Israeli genocide, which since its beginning has left more than 42,000 Palestinian civilians killed and more than 92,000 wounded. For her part, ex-Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg condemned the genocide and affirmed that silence regarding this situation means complicity. Let's now take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesol English. We will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. Israel is mobilizing some troops to launch a new war phase against southern Lebanon. The escalation of tensions between the Hezbollah resistance group and Israel has intensified after the attacks against residential areas in Beirut, which killed at least 50 people and wounded dozens. According to local media, in recent days, Israeli, uh, the Israeli occupation forces has pulled out military artillery, including tanks from some areas of the Gaza Strip, to position them on the border with Lebanon. The Netanyahu administration has confirmed that bombardments against Lebanon will not stop, whereas Hezbollah says it has the capacity to face a prolonged war with Tel Aviv. And in southern Lebanon, new Israeli attacks against several Hezbollah resistance military centers are reported in the last hours as part of the escalation of hostilities between the two countries. During Sunday morning, the Israeli Air Force fighter jets bombed dozens of targets, including military structures of the resistance movement. In this context, the Aviv threatened to intensify attacks against Hezbollah in the coming days. Meanwhile, Lebanon answers to the Zionist offensive by firing more than 100 rockets at Israeli military installations in Ramat David. And following up the situation in the area, the number of dead in the bombing perpetrated by Israel against a neighborhood in the capital of Lebanon, Beirut, has risen to 50. Authorities also confirmed the number of wounded has risen to 66, while another 11 people are still missing. In this sense, the rescue groups emphasize that search and rescue operations are continuing in the areas attacked by Israel. The bombing took place on Friday, September 20th, after a wave of coordinated explosions in communication devices. Lebanon's Hezbollah resistance movement launched its most far-reaching attack on Israeli military bases in the occupied Palestinian territories. The Israeli Ramad David Air Base is located in the northern part of the Israeli occupied Palestinian territories, just 20 kilometers southeast of Haifa. Since October 7th, Hezbollah has been carrying out numerous similar attacks against the occupied territories, after the Zionist regime significantly intensified its aggressions against Lebanon. In this context, Hezbollah Deputy Chief Naim Qasem says his group is ready to face all military possibilities in its battle against Israel. In Iran, the number of dead workers in the explosion at the Tabas mine increased to 51. A gas leak explosion at the Tabas coal mine in eastern Iran has claimed the life of at least 51 workers, with 20 others injured. The blast occurred on Saturday night, trapping some workers on the ground. Rescue operations are ongoing. To face the catastrophe, the Iranian head of state, Masoud Pekhishkian, ordered the security teams to initiate the investigations in order to clarify the possible causes of this accident. All authorities have announced three days of public mourning in the province. In Iran, police forces dismantled a terrorist cell attempting to infiltrate the country from the southeast border to commit acts of sabotage. Iranian border police commander Ahmad Ali reported that his forces repelled the attempt of a terrorist group to enter the country through the Sirkan border zone, wanting to carry out destructive operations in the country. The military high command recognized the vigilance of the Iranian border guards and detailed that its troops inflicted a severe strike to the terrorists. He also detailed that a large amount of weapons and ammunition were confiscated from the cell, including portable wireless devices and an improvised explosive device. In our news in the United States, social organizations warned that over the last few months, the number of homeless people in the country has risen to 550,000. 
According to research, it is expected that by the end of 2024, the number of homeless people in the United States will exceed 653,000, the highest number ever since 2007. Data shows that compared to 2023, the number of people living on the streets in shelters and in tents has increased by 10%. Experts warn that the rise in homelessness is due to the increase of the country's economic and social problems. French President Emmanuel Macron lost popularity after calling for early parliamentary elections after appointing Michel Barnier as prime minister. According to a survey by the French Public Opinion Institute, 75% of French citizens disapprove the Macron administration from only a 25% approval. 55% of respondents disapprove of Prime Minister Michel Barnier, even though he has been in office for less than three weeks. Most French citizens reject President Macron for what they consider a violation of the Republican tradition in the country, allowing the installation of a conservative government, ignoring the results of parliamentary elections that pointed to the formation of a left-wing government. And in Martinique, several hundred people continue to protest against the high cost of living despite the curfew imposed by the authorities. Since last Friday, Prefect Jean-Christophe Bouvier has ordered a ban on rallies as part of the fourth day of protests, but the villagers denounced that the authorities are perpetrating colonial methods of repression. Martinique's population also denounced that food is 40% more expensive than in mainland France, a discontent that is expressed by several dozen people blocked in two supermarkets in the city of Le François. Despite Bouvier's orders to deploy more security forces to increase the number of arrests, the protests have not been quelled. We are simple and concise. Today, we have speed cameras like in France, the same fines, the same prisons, the same taxes if not more. We have the Octre de Mer tax, the same roads, the same ID cards, the same passports. So why should it be different when it comes to food? Why do they insist on showing us that we are not French when it comes to food prices? Either we are 100% French, or we are not. We believe we are French, so we are asking that food prices be aligned with those in mainland France. We now have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Tresor English, there you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Found your break, don't go away. Welcome back. The United Nations has raised its alarm level, the large-scale assault by rapid support forces on the city of El Fasher, capital of North Darfur. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged the leader of the armed group, Mohamed Hamdan Takalo, to act responsibly and stop the attack. Guterres said it was inconceivable that the war in Paris have repeatedly ignored calls for a cessation of facilities and he reminded them of their obligation under international humanitarian law to protect civilians. The UN Secretary General insisted on the need for a ceasefire in all conflict zones in Sudan, but warning that any escalation could spread the conflict along intermunicipal lines throughout Darfur. And we have no effective global response to emerging, complex, and even existential threats. The climate crisis is destroying lives, devastating communities, and ravaging economies. And we all know the solution, a just phase out of fossil fuels, and yet emissions are still rising. New technologies, including AI, are being developed in a moral and legal vacuum without governance or guardrails. The United Nations called for support to the ceasefire in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The head of the United Nations Department of Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, insisted on the need to support diplomatic efforts to implement the ceasefire agreed between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda in order to restore peace in the country. Lacroix also urged all armed groups to disarm unconditionally to give a chance to the ongoing political process. The head of the Peace Operations Department also held meetings with political actors, civil society, including religious denominations, the diplomatic community, and representatives of UN system program agencies. The World Health Organization reported that more than 25,000 suspected and confirmed cases of MPOX disease have been reported in Africa. 
During a press conference in Geneva, the organization's spokesperson, Margaret Harris, declared that the three countries with the most reported cases of MPOX are the Democratic Republic of Congo, with 21,835 suspected cases and 717 deaths, Burundi with 1,498 suspected cases, and Nigeria with 935 suspected cases and no deaths. The agency also declared an international health emergency on August 14th and warned of the existence of a new STD, which can be transmitted by close contact with skin. And Sri Lanka will hold for the first time in its history a second election recount after none of the top candidates received more than 50% of the direct support of the electorate. This electoral commissioner will only consider candidates Aruna Kumare Disanayake, who received the highest number of votes, 42.31%, and Sajith Premadasa, with the second highest number of votes, 32.76%. It's important to note that the elections are governed by a preferential voting model in which voters can choose up to three candidates in order of preference. If at the end of the recount none of the candidates obtains more than 50% of the votes, the votes in which they were second and third choices will be added. In Argentina, scores of fire fires are battling several forest fires ravaging through the province of Córdoba. On Saturday, authorities reported that emergency teams drawing from over 700 firefighters and brigade members are trying to control active fires that are advancing in different areas of the province. Reportedly, the flames reached at least 20 houses and many neighbors had to be evacuated from the towns of Los Cocos and Capilla del Monte. So far this year, 1,500 forest fires have been reported in the province of Córdoba most of them over the last three months, which have destroyed 30,000 hectares. Yesterday, it was a very hard day. The whole town was an inferno. Several houses were burned. In the afternoon, the fire spread very quickly, despite the effort of local firefighters and of almost all of Cordoba. In Ecuador, the government temporarily cuts electricity service for a period of nine hours in 12 of the country's 24 provinces. The presidency's general secretary of communication said that electricity service will be suspended from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time this Sunday. During this period, the emergency operations committee is expected to evaluate the situation in order to analyze if it is necessary to implement other complementary measures. The Ecuadorian territory has been suffering from power outages since the end of 2023 due to the most intense drought in the last 61 years. And the Polish government has declared a state of emergency in the southwest part of the country due to floods that have directly affected 57,000 people. Government authorities warned that the state of emergency declared in 749 localities affects 2.3 million inhabitants, over 6,544 have been evacuated to shelters. According to the authorities, thousands of infrastructures were affected by the floods, among them over 11,000 houses and about six public and privately owned institutional buildings. According to official estimates, the damages so far are estimated in the excess of 1 billion US dollars. And in Caracas, capital of Venezuela, the last day of Fidel Venn 2024 took place an event where technological progress meets the country's commitment with progress. The International Telecommunications Fair showcased the best technological advances in the sector. In this edition, the number of national companies increased from 103 last year to 118, with almost 200 exhibitors in total. The event also offered master classes, technical demonstrations, and talks that revolve around the use of artificial intelligence, digital marketing, and how to humanize technology. Fidelven also served as a platform for the signing of more than 10 cooperation and healthy competition agreements between large and small companies. We believe that today is a great opportunity to work for all Venezuelans so that they can look inward and see that here we are developing a technological change, an implementation of an optic fiber network of more than 10 million strands that will probably reach 20 million fiber points in the next five years. I am extremely excited, and I am aware that I am part of this transcendental moment for the country. We are changing and changing for the better.
in China, the 11th edition of the Silk Road International Film Festival is on the way to celebrate world cinema and discover new films and voices from around the world. The meeting, held in the northwestern city of Xi'an, aims to promote cultural exchange and offer an insight into the customs and traditions of the countries along the Silk Road. This year, the Silk Road Gold Award received more than 2,000 film submissions from at least 163 countries, setting a new record for the organization. The festival, which runs until September 25th, has presented more than 500 national and international films since 2014. Like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, www.telesolenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesol English, I'm with Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.